The Israel-Hamas war has entered its sixth month. But elsewhere, a related crisis is unfolding. The Houthis will consider that any Western partner and supporter of Israel is considered a fair target. In the Red Sea, Houthi rebels from Yemen began attacking ships with missiles and drones last November threatening one of the world's busiest shipping routes. It's what we call a super highway for the nighttime trade. You're talking about 20% of the global container traffic, you're talking about 8 to 10% of the crude oil refined product trade, you're talking about 5% of uh, commodity trades in terms of dry bulk. What has been the impact on Asia? pesticide <laughs> Vì rõ ràng là ngành sản phẩm thời trang của chúng tôi thì chúng tôi tiến độ trước kia là tiến độ là theo tháng, theo tuần thì hiện nay là chúng tôi đang phải tính tiến độ sản xuất là theo ngày. And with the Houthis vowing to expand their attacks, is the worst still to come? It will be very difficult to go back to the period of stability that we enjoyed in the past. It's a pleasant spring day in Dak Lak, Vietnam. Workers at C Mexico's coffee factories are sorting, grinding, and packaging the season's coffee harvest. Trước đây thì đa số cà phê Việt Nam á, khoảng chừng 10 mười mấy năm trước thì đa số nhà họ nhập về để họ là chiết để làm cà phê hòa tan hoặc là chủ yếu là cà phê hòa tan hoặc là thay thế cho cái sản phẩm Arabica giá trị không cao. Tuy nhiên thì 10 năm gần đây thì cà phê robusta của Việt Nam đã chọn được chọn là cái cái loại hạt chính để người ta rang để người ta làm cho những cái ly espresso có nghĩa là giữ nguyên hạt rang để tạo ra những cái ly cà phê thì có nghĩa là cái chất lượng của cà phê robusta của Việt Nam đã gần như là chiếm cái hương vị chính cho những cái ly cà phê espresso ngon của thế giới. Many of these beans will be bound for Europe, which has become Vietnam's largest coffee market. About 50 to 60 percent of the beans grown in Vietnam are exported to the continent. But since last year, something has put the brakes on San Mexico's plans for market expansion. À, những cái xung đột quét nước lớn xảy ra và gần đây là cái tình hình ở tại Trung Đông, à, tại cái eo biển và tại biển đỏ thì dẫn tới là những cái à, nó đã dịch chuyển qua những cái sự bất thường rồi à, nên công ty là cũng không đi tập trung vào mạnh được phát triển những cái thị trường mới được à, tuy có một số thị trường cũng rất là tiềm năng nhưng mà với cái rủi ro về để chính trị như vậy thì chúng tôi không thể tập trung vào những cái thị trường mới để phát triển mạnh hơn cái cà phê Việt Nam. The disruption in the export of Vietnamese coffee beans has its origins in a conflict over 5,000 kilometers away. The Israel-Hamas war is entering its sixth month, where, under unrelenting Israeli bombing, the death toll has surpassed 30,000. While the violence has been largely contained within the borders of Gaza, there are signs of the conflict elsewhere. In particular, the Red Sea. The Red Sea has become volatile over the last few months. The trigger for that, of course, is the October 7 Hamas attack on Israel and Israel's reprisal, which is, of course, of a scale that is unprecedented. The Red Sea is vital to global trade. It is the shortest route for goods traveling from Asia to Europe, connecting the Suez Canal in Egypt to the Indian Ocean. It's what we call a super highway for the nighttime trade. You're, you're talking about 20% of the global container traffic, you're talking about 8 to 10% of the crude oil refined product trade, you're talking about 5% of uh, commodity trades in terms of dry bulk. We also have LNG and LPG, which are the main arteries, right? So it essentially caters around 20,000 ships per year. 
A critical choke point of the Red Sea shipping route is the Bab el Mandeb Strait, a 50 kilometer wide channel between Yemen and Djibouti. Since late last year, this vital trading route has come under duress. The Houthis in Yemen have begun attacking ships sailing these waters. After the, the war in Gaza started, the Houthis, which is this insurgency in Yemen that has been around for more than two decades, the Houthis declared war on Israel. And as a result, they started firing uh, rockets, missiles and uh, drones at mostly civilian ships that were crossing the Red Sea. They have taken it upon themselves to support the cause of Palestine and they have taken a very strong stand to support the people of Gaza and what they are going through. And the route that they have taken is to threaten global commerce. What happened is November 19th, I think that's where the first ship called MV Galaxy Leader was attacked or rather boarded by the Houthis. It was captured and since then as per our records, we've seen close to around 40 attacks on the commercial shipping vessel. The Houthis will attack ships directly or with missiles or drones. At first, the targets were ostensibly Israeli ships. But soon, the target list would expand. Well, it goes into the logic of the Houthis, which is that the West has been supporting Israel, and to a certain extent, uh, there is an uh, element of uh, truth to that, the fact that the U.S. has been supplying uh, uh, arms to Israel since the war started and even before that. The Houthis will consider that any Western partner, any supporter of Israel is considered a fair target. As more ships came under fire, the Indian Navy, which patrols the Indian Ocean and the Gulf of Aden, began receiving calls for help from distressed vessels. The Indian Navy has responded uh, on a number of times uh, in this last few months. On 11th of Jan, the US attacked the Houthi land areas by Tomahawk missiles and by US aircraft. Now, in response to that attack, the Houthis carried out a missile attack on uh, uh, Genko Picardi on 17th of January. Once the ship moved out of the area, INS Vishakapatnam, which was mission deployed there, uh, provided assistance uh, to look at what is the explosive ordnance uh, state, because the, since the ship has been, should there, there should not be any greater danger. The second thing which happened was uh, that the firefighting took place on board MV Marlin Luanda. What happened, the ship had been stuck uh, by a missile and there was extensive fire which was going on. But soon, other ships were hit. On March 24th, Chinese-owned vessel MV Huangpu was attacked by four anti-ship missiles, a sign that ships flying any flag could be at risk. The Houthis had signed an agreement, a non-aggression agreement in a way, with China and Russia. Two days after that, they uh, uh, fired at uh, Chinese ships. So, uh, I have difficulties seeing the pattern here. We should not assume that the Houthis is like the government of Yemen following a rational chain of command with a rational decision-making process. You must understand uh, the Houthis do not have state-of-the-art command and control facilities the way a normal uh, state-armed, state-supplied, state-sponsored uh, full-scale set of armed forces might have. They don't have enough intelligence, so it means that they have outdated data or maybe something we are not really linking there. In currently, they are basically owned by Indian ship owners or even Asian ship owners. They attack it. As February turned to March, the attacks would claim their first vessel and human casualties. 
We saw a, a vessel called MV Ruby Mar, which was attacked around February 18th, and it recently sank. That was a total loss, and a most recent attack being True Confidence, which was attacked, and we saw a loss of lives there. Three crew ship, uh, seafarers were killed, right? So essentially, it's a very volatile situation. The merchant shipping is being affected, and we are seeing a lot of uh, ship owners as well as shipping companies diverting their vessels. Because of the escalating risks, shipping companies began avoiding the Suez Canal and the Red Sea, taking alternate routes. So in the Suez Canal, already down almost 40 to 50 percent kind of traffic. And then they announcing that uh, Egypt uh, government announcing uh, in January revenue of uh, 2024 is almost down 30 percent compared to last year. So we saw major shipping companies, particularly container shipping companies, rerouting and sending those ships via Cape of Good Hope and bypassing Red Sea. I think after that we've started seeing a lot of uh, crude oil carriers, what we call clean tankers, or those who are carrying clean products like jet oil, kerosene, and those getting diverted. If you start diverting, you're looking at an additional 10 to 15 days for a particular voyage, depending on if you're going from Asia to Europe or if you're coming to Europe to Asia. You have higher what we call bunker consumption, so more fuel consumptions, right? You are spending more time at sea in terms of the cargo being carried. So they've forced the rates not just insurance rates, but also cargo rates up by sailing around, you know, most of Africa, the so-called Cape of Good Hope route. These longer sailing times have disrupted global supply chains, which are still recovering from COVID and the war in Ukraine. Logistics companies like DHL have warned their customers to anticipate transit delays of up to 40 days. The situation in the Red Sea, unfortunately, has been a reminder to everyone that it will be very difficult to go back to the period of stability that we enjoyed in the past. Um, so, you know, we've had to reroute uh, a number of shipments that were on course. So, while previously, where there was a stability, customers could focus on one, the most efficient possible source for a particular product. Now, we are giving them alternatives. We approach our customers and say, these products are likely to have a delay, and we work uh, collaboratively to identify within our network where similar products may be located and we can ship it um, somewhere else. With changes in source ports, longer shipping routes, and higher insurance premiums, shipping rates have jumped two to four times since December. So if you know the cargo come to you in right time, punctually, then you don't need many inventory uh, in store. But now you are seeing that so much delay could happen. And that means you need to manage the supply chain and inventory very well, or maybe much higher uh, inventory you need. So it means every inventory will add in cost leading to high price risk. With no let up in attacks in the Red Sea, what has been the impact on supply chains in Asia? Satish Goel, from the Indian city of Karnal, has been in the rice business since 1981. This is our parental business. My grandfather started in 1966 with rice meal. And after that, we are doing our fourth generation. My children are doing this business. We are exporting export from 87 to 88. Mainly export Middle East country, में सभी countries के अंदर हम export कर रहे हैं Iran, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, UAE. Basically, जो major part है हमारा export का वो इनी countries में. In recent decades, the Middle East has developed a taste for Indian basmati rice. About a third of Indian rice exports goes to the region. 4.4 million ton तक Basmati rice हमने हिंदुस्तान से एक्सपोर्ट किया है उसमें से मेजर हमारा पार्ट रहता है ईरान को जिसको हम 1.2 मिलियन टन ईरान को एक्सपोर्ट करते हैं 1 मिलियन टन के आसपास हम सऊदी अरेबिया और 7-8 लाख टन के आसपास हम इराक को और 2 या 3 लाख टन हम यमन को एक्सपोर्ट करते हैं बाकी 5-6 लाख टन हम पूरे वर्ल्ड के अंदर यूरोप हो गया यूएसए हो गया इन कंट्रीज में मिला के 5-6 लाख टन 
हम हिंदुस्तान से एक्सपोर्ट करते हैं But for Indian rice to reach some ports in the Middle East and the West, it has to sail through the beleaguered Red Sea, a risky route with the Houthi attacks on ships. Like many other commodities, some of Satish's rice must now travel via the Cape of Good Hope instead. With Red Sea, we have basically two things that have come to us. One is the freight increase. It has been a very big part of us. And one is the time. जो कि हमारा जहाँ पे आठ से दस दिन लगते थे वहाँ पर हमारा कार्गो एक एक महीने में भी नहीं पहुँच पा रहा है फॉर इंडिया वेन वी यूज सुज कैनाल एंड वी पास थ्रू द रेड सी अवर आइडिया एंड एस्टिमेशन इज दैट अराउंड थर्टी फाइव परसेंट ऑफ द टोटल एक्सपोर्ट वुड बी वुड बी अफेक्टेड एंड दिस टर्नस आउट टू बी समे क्लोज टू फोर्टी सेवन बिलियन डॉलर सो दिस इज कम्प्लीटली डिरेल्ड अवर एक्सपोर्ट प्लान Earlier this year, freight charges jumped by some 150%. As a result, India's exports of premium basmati rice dropped by half compared to a year ago. And it is hitting those at the bottom of the value chain, the farmers. Look, I have 60 acres of basmati variety. तो उनमें आप मोटा मोटी लगा लो मेरे पास 11-1200 क्विंटल के आसपास मेरा बासमती दान था हमारा जो हरियाणा का जो चावल था जो बासमती चावल वो ज़्यादातर समुंदर के रास्ते बाहर जाता था उसमें अब समस्या यह आएगी उसमें बीच में समुंदर में अटैक हुए हैं उन अटैक की वजह से वो जो विदेशों में जाने का रास्ता था वो दूसरी जगह को रास्ता घुमा के और वो रास्ता पड़ गया उसको लंबा इससे पहले हमारे चावल का दान का भाव था करीबन पाँच हज़ार रुपये प्रति क्विंटल वो दिक्कत आने के बाद जो समुंदर में अटैक हुआ है उसके बाद हमारे चावल का भाव इसका दान का भाव चार हज़ार के आसपास रह गया वो सारा का सारा सीधा अटैक किसान के ऊपर पड़ा है क्योंकि जो हमारे व्यापारी खरीद रहे थे किसान से सीधा मंडी से जो व्यापारी खरीद रहे थे उनको सीधी सीधी दिक्कत आ गई भाई हमारे चावल पर हमें घाटा हो रहा है तो वो घाटा पूरा करने के लिए वो किसान का जो दान है उसको हज़ार रुपये बारह सौ रुपये प्रति क्विंटल कम ले रहे हैं उसका सीधा मोटा मोटा असर सीधा का सीधा किसान के ऊपर पड़ रहा है एल्सवे इन वियतनाम कॉफी प्रोड्यूसर्स आर फेसिंग सिमिलर चैलेंजेस द प्राइस ऑफ वियतनामीज रोबस्ट कॉफी सोल्ड इन दूएस एंड यूरोप has hit a 28-year high on tight supplies. Bên cạnh đó thì chi phí tăng hơn lên rất là nhiều cả về chi phí vận chuyển cũng như là là khi mà cái giá của cà phê nó cao như vậy thì cái chi phí tài chính để vận hành cái kinh tế, vận hành cái 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 kinh doanh nó cũng khó khăn hơn. Nếu mà tính thì chính xác thì nó khoảng chừng Mỹ và châu Âu thì hai năm vừa qua và đặc biệt cụ thể năm nay nè thì nó giảm khoảng chừng là 15% so với với các năm so với cùng kỳ. Vietnam's textile industry is also having trouble sewing up profits. The sector is already facing challenges from 2023, where exports fell approximately 5 to 6%. If the Red Sea crisis persists, revenues could fall for a second consecutive year. À, vì rõ ràng là ngành sản phẩm uh, uh, thời trang của chúng tôi thì chúng tôi tính tiến độ trước kia là chúng tôi tính độ tiến độ là theo tháng theo tuần thì hiện nay là chúng tôi đang phải tính tiến độ sản xuất là theo ngày thì rõ ràng là không chỉ thời gian vận chuyển uh, quốc tế bị kéo dài mà hiện nay là giá cả trên một container uh, xuất khẩu từ đây sang châu Âu đã có thể tăng đến 3 lần uh, thì đây cũng là một trong những cái sức ép rất lớn uh, về chi phí uh, 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 vận chuyển uh, trên một đơn vị sản phẩm trong cái bối cảnh hiện nay là nền kinh tế thế giới thì đang bị lạm phát trên toàn cầu vẫn đang ở mức cao và chưa kiểm soát được và chưa có cái chính sách hạ lãi suất của Fed thì nó cũng ảnh hưởng gián tiếp ảnh hưởng đến cái sức cạnh tranh của tổng công ty mình với chúng tôi. For some producers, this is a twin crisis. While demand for the exports has fallen, the cost of inputs has risen. When the Genco Picardi 
and the Ruby Ma were attacked by Houthis in the Red Sea, both were carrying fertilizers. The crisis is not just for our exports, but it is also for our imports, <laughs> because huge imports of ours are from uh, fertilizers that comes out from those countries. And fertilizer imports have uh, multiplied in a major way in last 10 years in India. You find that uh, uh, India's imports of fertilizers from Russia has gone up by 276 percent. What is at stake uh, is, is something which is uh, uh, around 39 percent of the total fertilizer consumption that that comes in. Russia is a major supplier of fertilizer ingredients to Asia, where export routes traverse the Red Sea. It is also a key source of oil. Russia became the biggest exporter to India, right? India is, uh, is ex last year was around 40% of crude oil import basket was Russian crude oil, right? We saw that, we saw China increasing purchase, uh, Europe getting more oil, more LNG from the US as well. In that sense, if it's going around Cape of Good Hope, you're spending again more than two weeks, right? Freight rates are higher as well. We may not yet be feeling the full impact of the Red Sea attacks. One reason is that prior to the crisis, container rates had plummeted from COVID highs. This was due to the oversupply of container capacity, as well as the slower than expected COVID recovery in places like China and Europe. As the economies opened up, people started spending time outside more, experiences and not buying consumer goods in the way they bought over the four year, right? So a lot of shipping capacity became available because of soft demand. The container freight rates had come down almost 90% because of the overcapacity, right? This Red Sea crisis is bad, but it's not bad as COVID, right? Because at COVID times, we had uh, basically the ports also stuck, the shipping capacity not available. This time we had the shipping capacity available. Similarly, an oil supply glut has also staved off any sharp spikes in energy prices. For now, the oil prices are not impacted much because there's ample supply availability in the global oil market. So we haven't seen much of an impact. We've had a week, uh, uh, not, so, not so strong, or I would say severe winter in, Euro in Europe as well. The storage levels are pretty good. So essentially the commodity markets are oversupplied and there has been uh, shipping capacity available, which has been able to dampen the effects on the commodity prices. But this may not last. Should the Red Sea crisis continue, the worst could hit us in the coming months. August to October is typically the peak season for container traffic. December is kind of declining seasonal uh, kind of demand uh, because high season is actually a third quarter before Christmas, before Thanksgiving holiday, and also uh, uh, before uh, this winter period. But when we come into third quarter, and then up to uh, early post quarter, which rather say is the highest traffic, we believe that this could be much higher risk uh, in terms of uh, how can I say prices, in terms of the supply chain issue, um, in terms of optionality, especially Southeast Asia, and that is something uh, we need to consider uh, and the, uh, manage the risk. Meanwhile, as the summer sowing season approaches, Sandeep can only pray for the end of the crisis. उसका खर्चा लगातार दिन प्रतिदिन बढ़ता जा रहा है जैसे खाद के बारे में लगा लो किसी पेस्टिसाइड के बारे में देख लो खत पर वार ना से कोई भी दवाइयां हैं कीटनाशक दवाइयां हैं जो उसकी लागत आओ सारा जोड़ के अगर उसकी लागत को देखा जाए तो उसको लागत भी नहीं पूरी हो रही किसान की क्योंकि हमारे यहां तो इतनी लागत नहीं है बासमती की क्योंकि बहुत महंगा चावल है धान का भाव तभी बढ़ेगा जब हमारा चावल दूसरे देशों में जाएगा Rather than abating in the coming months, could the attacks intensify? Will other non-state actors, inspired by the Houthis, join the fray? Against the backdrop of the Red Sea attacks, is a civil war that has been raging for nearly a decade. In September 2014, the insurgent Houthis took over the Yemeni capital of Sana'a, toppling the government. 
the Houthis would take the presidential palace in January the next year. Saudi Arabia would join the conflict, siding with pro-government forces. So the war in Yemen starts in 2015, when Saudi Arabia decides to launch the coalition uh, against the Houthis, which were gaining uh, ground, gaining control of the Yemeni territory. Then, in addition to that, the Iranian regime started supplying the Houthis uh, with uh, that type of uh, systems, especially the ballistic missiles. The Yemeni civil war became a proxy war in the long-standing rivalry between Saudi Arabia and Iran. So, very quickly, the Iranian regime saw the war in Yemen as an opportunity to uh, force uh, uh, Saudi Arabia into a long protracted conflict. So there was an opportunity uh, for Iran at a cheap cost, actually, to supply the Houthis with weaponry, with military know-how that would be used against Saudi Arabia and that would get Saudi Arabia dragged down into a long insurgency. It was in this conflict that the Houthis acquired the capability to target ships. The first report of such attack was 2016. At the time, they were targeting Emirati or Saudi military ships. What's different now is that they are targeting civilian ships. Groups backed by Iran have been called the Axis of Resistance. They include militia groups in Iraq, Syria, Hezbollah in Lebanon, Hamas in Gaza, and the Houthis in Yemen. The Houthis happen to be in the right position to act as um, one uh, what you call unexpected pincer movement against the supporters of Israel, and that is to threaten the maritime traffic coming out of the Red Sea. And that's why fingers point at Iran. Because if Iran is supporting Hamas, uh, it makes sense to have a pincer movement coming from this unexpected direction, i.e. the Houthis. Iran has been very cautious, expressing that it has no responsibility, it is not involved in the Houthi operations. But at the same time, the Iranian regime is always praising uh, Hamas or the Houthis and actually using uh, the, the attacks, the, the crisis, to say that Iran is on the good side, that Iran is against the Western interference in the region, that Iran is supporting Palestine and so on. Apart from ships, the attacks would spread to other Israeli targets. On January 15, Iran launched missile strikes in Syria and Iraq, with their alleged targets being Israeli spy bases. The next day, Iran would hit the Balochistan area of Pakistan. Iran's foreign minister went on to claim it was targeting Pakistani militants linked to Israel. They try to link us to the Middle Eastern security framework and, and that uh, they said that Pakistan is standing with Israel. Whereas Pakistan's position has been very clear on that. We do not accept Israel as a state. Two days later, Pakistan would retaliate with missile strikes in Iran, supposedly targeting insurgents from Balochistan. Unfortunately for us, the Baloch uh, terror groups have found a relocation base, uh, not just in Afghanistan, but also in Iran's ungoverned areas. The episode was a blip in typically cordial relations between Iran and Pakistan. However, areas of friction remain. Pakistan had previously raised concerns that Iran is recruiting militants from its territory. Near the border separating Pakistan and Afghanistan lies Parachina. The majority of its residents belongs to the Shi'i faith. Here, Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps had recruited hundreds of Pakistani Shi'i fighters, like Haider Abbas. 
ہماری گروپ کی تو زینبیون نام تھی اور ہم وہاں پہ جو گئے تھے وہ ایران کے سفاہ کیا نام ہے سفاہ پسدران ان کے انڈر میں تھے ہم اور ہمیں شام لے گئے تھے شام جس کو سیریا بھی کہتے ہیں پانچ ماہ میں وہاں پہ لڑوں ہمارے گروپ میں جو لوگ تھے وہ ایک سو پچہتر تھے پچہتر میں سے تقریباً بیس سے اوپر میرے دوست جو اسی گروپ میں تھے وہ شہید ہو گئے مقصد ان کا یہ ہے کہ بھائی جو ہمارے شیوں کے مقدسات ہے چاہے وہ جہاں پر بھی ہو وہ بیت المقدس ہو یا شام ہو یا عراق ہو یا سعودی عرب ہو جو بھی ہو اگر ان پہ کوئی آنچ آ جائے تو ہم اپنے جانوں کا نظرانہ پیش کریں گے The war in Gaza has become a call to arms to bolster recruitment for the axis of resistance. I haven't seen anyone yet that there is someone. But it is also that the Bait al-Muqaddas is our try, but the most important thing is that the Bait al-Muqaddas is that the Bait al-Muqaddas is that we have to take us to the Bait al-Muqaddas. We have to take us to the Bait al-Muqaddas. We have to take us to the Bait al-Muqaddas. یہ تقریباً آسی پرسنٹ میں کہہ سکتا ہوں اپنی طرف سے کہ آسی پرسنٹ لوگوں کی خواہش ہے کہ وہ جائے اور بیت المقدس کی دفاع کریں بیت المقدس کو آزاد کر دیں ایران کن ایزلی موبیلائز دی فرسٹریشن لیورج دی فرسٹریشن آف آلان آف دی پیپل ان دی ایر دی ریجن Uh, in Lebanon, in uh, the Palestinian territories, to weaponize the anti-West narrative. It has, again, a certain appeal to some people in the region, and that's why they will be able to recruit fighters across the region, in the Middle East and also uh, in other uh, countries of the, the region. Any youth which falls victim to terrorism is misplaced, uh, whether in the name of sectarianism whether in the name of larger jihad, whatever. Because the groups which are using them are not using them for religion. They're using them for political purposes. They're using them for their own state interests. And like the ships in the Red Sea, entities considered to have links to Israel could be the target of terror acts. In the region, India has been perceived to be pro-Israel. India also, I think, is cognizant of the potential unrest that can come out of Iran. Um, they are probably watching the um, Iran-Pakistan friction uh, quite a bit uh, because Pakistan obviously is a neighbor, is a neighbor with a history of conflict with, with India and any sort of instability there can have potential not one effects for India. There's an ecosystem that is supporting and enabling terrorism. Will that affect India? My answer is a cautious yes. You know, I don't want to again over emphasize or over interpret and make it into a kind of amber lights flashing situation. But it is subterranean. For instance, the Houthis. Or if they in turn are able to encourage some other groups to take the sea route. I think the possibility cannot be ruled out, which is why I think not only India, but all the stakeholders have to invest in MDA, Maritime Domain Awareness. And there is one other group that could wade into the troubled waters of the Red Sea. Pirates. Before the current crisis, the Red Sea and its surrounding waters were the hunting grounds for Somali pirates. So if you go back in the last 20 odd years, ever since the piracy attacks began off the east coast of Africa, what we now refer to as Somali piracy, the Indian Navy has been among the first, what you might call as, security providers. Analysts from SMP Global have warned that the Houthis could partner with Somali pirates to expand attacks on ships. One incident in particular revealed possible coordination between the two groups. The MV Ruin, a Maltese flagged vessel, had been initially hijacked, pirates had taken it. This was sometime in November, December. And in a very innovative way, 
they took this vessel towards Yemen and then they converted it into a mothership for piracy. Sometimes you find that Somalis also have some Yemenis who are indulging in piracy. So it's a mix. So I think India has to be aware that there could be activities that end the entire spectrum, not just terrorism, but high levels of criminality which could have state support. Yet, why has it been so difficult to stop the attacks in the Red Sea despite international coordination? To counter the Houthi threat in the Red Sea, the U.S. launched Operation Prosperity Guardian last December. It is a multinational maritime task force involving over 20 countries. The rules-based international order is about free access to the world's uh, seas for economic intercourse. Asia has no interest in seeing the demise of this order. I've argued that Operation Prosperity Guardian is actually uh, an unusual moment of hope for the uh, international multilateral uh, liberal order or, or liberal international order, uh, whichever label you prefer, uh, in the sense that uh, if you look at the list of states that have openly or you know, in, in some cases like Italy and I believe uh, uh, one other Middle Eastern state which preferred not to be named, but they are actively supporting behind the scenes. There is a reason that some nations chose to keep their participation anonymous. You know, sectors of global Muslim opinion, they don't want to be appear too upfront, to be siding with the United States. It's uh, perhaps a tightrope that the Biden administration is walking on in terms of op launching Operation Prosperity Guardian, while at the same time telling Israel, please cool it when it comes to you know, your planned uh, ground invasion of uh, Rafah in the south of the Gaza Strip. So uh, on the one hand, you, know, you need to keep commerce flowing. On the other hand, you need to tell your friend Israel to observe some degree of international law. While US leadership at sea has been much vaunted, it faced criticism in the chambers of the United Nations. In the case of uh, Israel, the fact that the US is vetoing um, you know, a lot of forward movement and to some degree the UK as well, that has prevented the UN uh, Security Council as well from uh, moving forward. The US is one of the five permanent members of the UN Security Council, in addition to China, France, Russia, and the United Kingdom. These members have the veto power on UN resolutions. Before March 25th, the US had vetoed two drafts of a Gaza ceasefire resolution. So where the war in Gaza has really affected the rules-based international order have been one on the United Nations, where basically it appears that the UN is quite powerless uh, to stop the excessive behavior of Israel uh, as it seeks retaliation. So the real um, question that this brings up is if the UN seems impotent, ineffective, then uh, you know, we already have very few restraints on what states can do internationally. Uh, this may suggest to states that are powerful or who have powerful friends that they can take riskier behavior, that they can be more aggressive um, in ways that are potentially destabilizing. China has been one of Washington's most vocal critics. China finds U.S. policy toward the Middle East uh, hypocritical as well as double standards. Because at one point, the uh, United States is urgent for respect of human rights and human uh, and liberties. But then the U.S. has denied the protection of human rights and liberty to the Palestinians in Gaza. On the other hand, 
Beijing's motivations have been called into question. So, even though some Americans are uh, criticizing China for trying to take advantage of the American trouble uh, in, in, in this Palestinian-Israeli conflict, I don't think we, China really have too much influence or too much uh, capability to really take advantage of this rivalry. I think China's position is basically to urge uh, the Houthis to stop doing that kind of attack on the commercial shipping on the Red Sea. But, but, but uh, basically, China wants the conflict to, 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 to stop, uh, to, to find ceasefire uh, in Gaza and to find a solution, uh, the two-state solution, for the long-term stability and peace of the Middle East. So they can criticize Israel, as they have. Uh, they can criticize the United States for not taking uh, enough action, which they have. But um, it's less clear what uh, the PRC itself is doing to uh, try to alleviate the situation. It's not entirely clear that they are really asking the Iranians to uh, rein in um, Hamas or the Hezbollah. But for right now, I think it is probably satisfied to just free ride on US, UK, and also European efforts of other states to try to ensure the safety of shipping that, uh, that's around the uh, Horn of Africa. Then, on March 25th, a breakthrough. The US abstained from a ceasefire vote, and a resolution to stop the fighting in Gaza was passed. The fact that the United States abstained is already a signal that, on the one hand, it does not want to jeopardize its special relationship with Israel. On the other hand, it cannot turn its eye from the atrocities that are taking place in Gaza. The US ambassador to the UN quickly after uh, the, the resolution was uh, passed, um, express the US uh, disagreement uh, with some elements of that resolution. And second, the US administration repeatedly said that it was a non-binding uh, resolution. The problem is that this resolution, like any resolution on ceasefire, is by a sense disconnected from what's happening on the battlefield. Uh, the only way uh, we can reach a ceasefire is if the two uh, sides fighting each other decide to uh, stop the conflict. So far, Hamas has rejected the ceasefire terms. Meanwhile, the Israeli assault on Gaza continues. Yet, should a ceasefire materialize, would this also stop the attacks in the Red Sea? This would depend on whether the Houthis can achieve their own strategic aims. The Houthis see the war in Gaza as a good way for them to show the world that they are uh, a military actor to uh, reckon with and also uh, to uh, strengthen their position in the negotiations inside Yemen. Uh, let's not forget that you have had uh, negotiations inside Yemen to put an end to the conflict uh, for several years now. Those negotiations have been difficult. So as a result, the war in Gaza is a good way also to raise uh, the stakes for the Houthis, to show that uh, there's no way for the UN, there's no way for Saudi Arabia, which is the biggest actor in the uh, Yemeni conflict, uh, to do without uh, the Houthis. Meanwhile, the attacks on ships continue. The Houthis have also vowed to expand their attacks to the east of the Red Sea. And despite the multilateral effort, Operation Prosperity Guardian has had limited success as naval assets have been spread thin over a large area. We're still seeing those attacks despite uh, what we call Operation Prosperity Guardian, right? That's US and UK hitting, hitting targets in Yemen, hitting, hitting some of these uh, actors in, in, on, in Yemen, and trying to reduce the frequency of these attacks. That has happened slightly, but we do have a, a situation where ships are still being targeted on a daily basis. This is a collective responsibility. And it's a pity that the other major navies who have the legs, sea legs, have chosen not to participate. And here I'm specifically drawing attention to countries like Japan, China, who also have an interest 
but have chosen to be relatively below the radar as far as the Red Sea is concerned. April is the period where annual shipping contracts are negotiated. This year, contract renewals have been delayed as exporters hope to wait out the Red Sea crisis. For supply chain companies in Asia, this means bracing for more choppy waters ahead. Thì tình hình hiện tại của biển đỏ là vẫn chưa có cái hướng mà lắng dịu. Thì cái đây là một thách thức rất lớn đối với doanh nghiệp logistics, tại vì đây là những cái yếu tố ảnh hưởng trực tiếp đến chất lượng dịch vụ của sự tiếp của doanh nghiệp và chúng tôi vẫn đang tiếp tục theo dõi sát cái diễn biến tại thị trường trên thế giới cũng như là đặc biệt là khu vực biển đỏ để chúng tôi có những cái hành động những cái linh hoạt trong cái cách thức vận hành khai thác để đảm bảo hoạt động phục vụ các hãng tàu được tốt nhất. In the coming months we may see more cost as a consequence of all that we rode in. You know, we are used to dealing with unexpected situations. If anything, this whole period has elevated the visibility and the value of the supply chain organizations. So what this essentially means is the global geopolitical order, which was very safe, or I would say something which the shipping companies, traders were not taking into account uh, in, in the global commerce, has now been disrupted, right? So geopolitics are at the forefront of what's happening with the global trade.